All right, welcome back to my chemistry videos to help us understand uh, some chemistry content here. Today we're going to look at spectator ions and then the net ionic equations that we can write after iodine, those spectator ions. This is like the important part of the chemical reaction as far as what's actually happening and what's changing. Now, spectator ions are a lot like spectators uh, when we use that in more of a popular culture term. Uh, they're the part that don't actually take place in the reaction, but they might be just there to kind of see what's going on. Um, and when we're doing that, we're going to look at a balanced chemical equation and we're going to ID the phases of matter for each of those substances. And then we're going to find the particles that don't change phase of matter or don't change their charge. I like to think of a spectator as, uh, like I said, in a sporting context. And specifically, I like to talk about soccer moms when we when we talk about spectator ions. So uh, most soccer moms drive a pretty sweet van and what they do is they drop off their kid at that soccer game and then a lot of times those soccer moms will actually leave uh, their kid at the game. Now the question here is this mom, um, are they that important for the actual soccer game to occur? So they leave their kid, they drive off, the kid plays the game and then the soccer mom is going to come back to pick up their child. Now, when they return, uh, their child probably looks a little bit different. For example, their child might have blood on their jersey or grass stains, and that's because the child actually took place in that game or it took place in that event. So uh, this is the analogy to the, the change of the substance in a chemical reaction. After the game, the child looks different, has a physical difference to their appearance and that's what we would see as a solid forming or a gas forming whereas the mom looks the exact same. Um, furthermore, couldn't a different mom um, or a different parent came with a different van to pick up the kid? Is it that imperative? Is, that, is it that important uh, how the kid arrives at the game? Could they get to the game in a different way and that game still happen? And then on the other hand, what if the kid didn't show up? What if none of the kids showed up? Would a soccer game happen? And the same thing kind of happens in chemistry. We're talking about particles that need to be there for the reaction to happen. It might not be that important how they get there, how they get into the test tube, but they're the ones that are actually partaking. They're the, going to be the ones that change in the reaction, whereas there's some particles that are just there to kind of be the delivery agent for that uh, important chemical. So here's what we would do uh, to do that for an example of a single replacement reaction. And we normally do single and double replacements when we're talking about uh, spectator and net ionic equations. So you can see I have a balanced chemical equation. I have labeled my phases of matter uh, with some information. Now I can get solid um, and aqueous from a couple resources. On the periodic table, uh, zinc is listed as a solid element at room temperature. So that's how this is coming as a solid. And then um, this I can look up on my solubility table, my double replacement solubility table, and my gold resource that we are allowed to use. But oftentimes my reactants are provided to me uh, with their phase. For example, if I'm getting zinc from the chemical stock room, it's going to come as a solid. And my lead nitrate is likely going to come in solution form in one of our uh, Nalgene bottles that's already prepared for us. Um, the, other ex the other tip I can give you is that nitrate is one of those almost always aqueous ions um, in addition to sodium and potassium. <clears throat> so then on the product side, I'd have to look this up, but it does contain nitrate, so it's likely going to be aqueous, and I could look this up on a solubility table. And then lead on my periodic table is shown with those uh, filled in symbols, so I know it's a solid as well. So I'm going to look for particles that uh, that that don't change and those that do. My, my ones that don't change are the ones I circle. So I'm going to follow zinc from the left to the right. Zinc has the solid attached to it. And then zinc over here, the symbol that's at the back end of it's aqueous. So that did change. That's important. That's like grass stains on that jersey. My next particle, PB, starts out as aqueous, finishes solid. That did change. That was important. And then nitrate starts out as aqueous, and then the symbol attached to it's also aqueous. This is like the soccer mom uh, dropping off the kid here. And so because this doesn't change, we can throw a circle around those nitrates. Those are going to be the particles we're going to end up omitting uh, later on. <clears throat> Likewise, for a double replacement reaction, we uh, have our, our parts um, labeled with their phase of matter. In general, for double replacement for our worksheets, if you're not told any information, you can assume that the ionic reactants are aqueous. 
On the other hand, uh, we could also look these up on a solubility table and using some facts like nitrate and potassium ions are almost always aqueous, should be aqueous here. So then on the products, I'd have to look these up, but we have K and we have nitrate, so this is going to be an aqueous product. And then I could look this up on my solubility table, and I learned that lead to iodide is indeed a solid. Now following parts that change, PB begins as aqueous, PB finishes as solid, that change, that's important. Nitrate begins as aqueous, nitrate finishes as aqueous, it did not change, this will get a circle. Then I move on to my potassium ion, and I have um, aqueous, and I have potassium ion aqueous, so that didn't change, that's going to get a circle. And then I begins as aqueous, and I finishes as solid, so that gets uh, no circle, that's important. So on double replacements, notice that you have um, one product that's typically going to be aqueous, and then the two pieces that make that up will get circled, and then the, the part that you have a solid product, the two pieces that make that shouldn't get circled, those are important ions. So then net ionic equations are going to be those that we remove those per, uh, spectator ions and only keep the participating ions, the important ones, because that's the meat and potatoes of our reaction. So we've already ID'd our spectators by circling them. Now we just need to rewrite that equation uh, without those spectators, and we need to remember a few things. First, we need to break apart ionic compounds into their component ions. In fact, you could actually do this thing called a molecular ionic equation first. It does add more work, and, but it is a good way to really see what's going on. Um, so if it's aqueous, it gets broken apart. Uh, include charges on ions. If we have an ionic particle, we need to show that charge and respect the fact that it's a charged particle. And then everything, including both the number of particles and then the charges on those particles, needs to be balanced when we do a net ionic equation. Um, so let's take a look at how that looks. Going back to our single replacement example, uh, we had the nitrate uh, circled here. So uh, these are our spectators. We need to take these away. So then I'm going to rewrite everything that's not circled, uh, including my charges and including my um, quantity of each of these chemicals. So now zinc, since it's an element, it's a zero charge. And uh, lead, since it's an ion, it's going to have a charge of what it happens to be. It's lead 2, based on the information in this formula. Then we have zinc as an ion, so that's going to have a charge. But then lead by itself is an element, so it's going to be a zero charge. And we should see that happening. Um, you could write a zero here. You don't have to, but sometimes I have us write zeros because that makes it easier to keep track of that there is not supposed to be a charge on this. Now notice that um, the things that are charged in this formula are aqueous. That's going to be a common theme. Also notice that when we have solids, we shouldn't be charged because as either an ionic compound solid or as an element solid, we can't exist um, by ourselves, so we have to be an uncharged particle. If we make sure this whole thing's balanced, I can count everything. I have one zinc, one zinc. I have one lead, one lead, and on the left side I have a plus two, and the right side I have a plus two, so my charge, positive two on each side of my arrow, also balances. You'll notice for single replacement reactions that you will typically have, uh, in fact probably always, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, where you do have charges, and that's okay, it doesn't have to add up to zero on both sides, it just needs to be the same plus or same minus charge on both sides of my arrow. The double replacement reaction, uh, going back, we've already identified that we have some spectators here. We have the K and the nitrates that are, are going to be our, our spectators. So we're going to rewrite everything that uh, isn't circled. So I'm taking ionic compounds here. I'm breaking it apart. So this is going to have to have a charge on the lead. It's going to be a plus 2. My iodide is going to have a charge. Now notice that there's a coefficient 2 here. That coefficient 2 also applies to the I, so that's important. And then my PBI2, since it's a solid, it's solidly stuck to, together, so I cannot break that apart. So I'm going to remove my spectators, my circled, and I'm going to rewrite with only my ionic charges and my um, appropriate coefficients. So if we check and see if this is balanced, I have one copy of lead, one copy of lead. I have two copies of iodide because I took this coefficient 2 and I added it in front of my I, and I have two copies of I. And then if I check out my charge, I have plus 2 on the left, then I have a minus 2 on the left because 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. So plus 2 minus 2 cancel to make a 0. And then there's no charge over here. Remember that ionic compounds, because they are neutral compounds, can't be charged. 
So that should take care of a couple examples of uh, both how we ID spectator ions and then how we uh, write the net ionic equation that results from those spectator ions being removed. Remember, these are showing the meat and potatoes of the reactions. These are the important particles that we happen to have in these reactions. Lead could have been delivered on a different anion. Um, iodide could have been delivered with a different cation, and we could have still had the same overall reaction because those spectators don't matter. Just like it doesn't matter which parent is dropping off and picking up the kid at the soccer game, it could be your mom, it could be your dad, it could be your friend's mom or dad. As long as those important players in the reaction that, that itself get to the game, that reaction is going to happen as predicted um, from our resources and from what we already know about chemical reactions. So I hope that helps and uh, good luck when you're working on these spectator ions and then the net ionic equations.